We're told that today is the age of the individual, the age of self-improvement. Books fly off the shelves, selling the secrets of wellness, meditation, stoicism, as approaches to fix what's broken inside each of us so that we can take control of our destiny and solve our own personal problems. Now, it's true that many problems can be solved by individuals working on their own. I myself have experienced the power of meditation and mindfulness to tackle chronic back pain that I suffered in recent years. But many problems can only be solved by cooperation. And that's when things get really tricky. What makes us cooperate? Why should I cooperate with you? We've evolved to prioritize the survival of our own individual genes. And in that sense, we're rivals. But we also know that if we cooperate, it'll be better for us all. This dilemma provides us with the thorniest challenges that we face as humans. They are all collective action problems, where the good of the group over the long term stands at odds with the good of the individual in the short term. These collective action problems show up throughout human society. In our households, who will do the dishes tonight? In our communities, will we pay for our purchases or steal? In our countries, how do we react when our party loses an election? And yes, even globally, will we profit from the oil beneath our feet or leave it in the ground to help tackle climate change? Now, sometimes collective action problems are solved. I know many of us probably live in houses where the dishes are stacked neatly inside the cupboards. Sometimes they're not, even though we know it would be better for us to solve them. How many people studied at university and lived in a house where the dishes just piled up in the kitchen sink and everyone wanted them to be cleaned, but everyone always thought that it was someone else's job? What's the difference between these two scenarios? The difference, quite simply, is the level of solidarity. Solidarity is a word that sums up a set of tools that humans have developed over millions of years to tackle collective action problems. Where it exists, we do not let selfish interests get in the way of the common good. Where it does not, life gets more unpleasant. My family is from Iraq. Iraqis know that it would be better for them not to live in conflict. They know that corruption is a plague that is devastating their country. And they know that if they were more united, they would be better able to protect their interests on the international stage. But painful experiences over decades have torn apart Iraqi solidarity. And that means that many Iraqis do not trust their fellow citizens who come from different ethnicities or groupings than their own. And so conflict continues, corruption continues, division continues. I spent a decade working at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the thing that inspired me most when I worked there was a simple phrase that was written in prominent places on the building, in our documents, and on the website. All lives have equal value. Now, that can sound like an obvious thing to say, but really living up to it is a radical vision. It's a true statement of global solidarity. Inspired by that statement, I wrote a book, The Responsible Globalist, which sets out ways that we can strengthen international cooperation based on the understanding that this requires global solidarity. Now, alongside some wonderful colleagues, I run a think tank called Global Nation, and we're interested in how we can make progress in solving collective action problems that do require cooperation between countries to tackle them. Climate change, pandemics, conflicts and forced migration, global inequality. Solidarity is the difference between 1.5 degrees of global warming and four degrees or more. It's the difference between millions of people, the most vulnerable people, dying in a new pandemic and swift collective action to stop that pandemic ever taking hold. It's the difference between our current conflagrations exploding into a new nuclear war and a return to times of peace. Solidarity is the golden thread that offers hope for a 21st century in which we can thrive. And yet, it's very little understood. What does solidarity consist of? How much solidarity do we currently have? Do we have more this year than last year or less? 
Extraordinarily, these are questions that have never been studied in a rigorous way, at least until now. Recently in New York, just as world leaders made their annual speeches at the UN headquarters a few streets away, my colleagues and I launched the first ever Global Solidarity Report to do just that. We analyze solidarity as consisting of three drivers which work in a mutually reinforcing cycle. Those drivers are identities. Do we feel a sense of solidarity? Institutions. Have we empowered international organizations to tackle problems and impacts? Are we solving those problems or not? These then are the drivers of global solidarity, identities, institutions, and impacts. And now the big reveal. How are we doing as a world? Well, I'd love to tell you that things were fine and dandy, but you probably wouldn't believe me. And it's not true. We are in the danger zone. But a close look at the data reveals a story that includes hope and also, more importantly, a way forward. Let's start with the good news. Identities. People everywhere feel more solidarity as humans than they're often given credit for. Nearly half of all people on this planet agree that they are citizens of the world. And they back up that fluffy concept with a willingness to pay and to be policed. Depending on the country, between a quarter and a half of all people say they want their taxes to go to solving global problems. And extraordinarily, more than half of respondents in almost every country surveyed say that they want international organizations to enforce environmental obligations. Now, of course, many people disagree with those statements and enforcing them or making them happen is fiendishly difficult. But by and large, the global public wants to see countries coming together. So the identities pillar of our scorecard is in the hopeful, if imperfect, green shoots zone. Now for the not so good news, institutions. So far, these public demands have only been half met at best. Institutions have not crumbled. Funding has edged up over time. Gender balance in key organizations has edged up. Trade volumes have edged up showing that non-governmental cooperation across borders has not collapsed despite talk of a new Cold War. But the transformational change that we need to face our crises has not materialized. And critically, just when countries need to agree with each other more and more, they are agreeing with each other less and less. As a result, the institution's pillar of our scorecard is in the danger zone. And finally, the really bad news, impacts. This institutional drift has resulted in impacts being at breaking point. Deaths and conflict have doubled in the last year alone. Carbon emissions have skyrocketed after falling during the pandemic. We've lost a whole decade of progress in vaccinating children. And despite sluggish growth in rich countries, the poor are falling even further behind. Put simply, whatever solidarity we've mustered to date, it's not working. And this not working doesn't only mean people dying today and the temperature rising. It also means that people's belief in the international system, that one bit of good news, is at risk. If that public solidarity fails, it'll become even harder to render global institutions successful and impacts will continue to spiral further downwards. So to reignite the cycle of global solidarity. We can and must do a better job of channeling the public support that does exist into a transformational institutional response that meets the moment of these troubled times. In the Global Solidarity Report, we set out three priorities of focus for the international community that we can do right now to meet that moment. They're not the only things that need doing, but they are perhaps among the most important. They are, firstly, we need a just climate transition now, ending new fossil fuel exploration, helping countries to make that change, and helping poor farmers who are struggling to make food in a climate that has already changed. Secondly, we must cooperate against viruses by building on and strengthening the pandemic fund and by signing a new global treaty, the Pandemic Accord, that sets the rules of the road so that countries know in advance how they will cooperate when the next pandemic comes. And finally, we need to pool global resources to make available the trillions of dollars that are needed to face our challenges together. That includes reimagining and building on the tired system of foreign aid 
as a truly solidaristic global public investment where every country contributes, every country decides, and every country benefits. Now, that probably all sounds like fine stuff, but not necessarily things that you can go away and implement when you leave this room. And this is, after all, the age of the individual. So what can we each do to contribute towards global solidarity? My advice is to start by really thinking about that phrase, all lives have equal value. It sounds obvious. Do you really believe it? If you believe it, do your actions really live up to it? As individuals, as members of our communities, as voters, and as people who every day can choose whether we spread division or unity on social media, we all contribute to the amount of solidarity there is on this tiny spinning rock. Let's each increase that level of solidarity, if only by a little bit. That's all that can be asked of you. And if we all did it, it would be more than enough. Thank you.